An elderly woman wakes in the middle of the night to the sounds of chaos just outside. She stumbles out of her bed in her nightgown, carrying a lantern, and rushes to check on the cows in her field. From a distance in the dark, she can see one of the cows lying on its side, dead. Standing over it is a fox, but something is wrong with it. The animal is standing on two legs, using its paw-like hands to tear at the cow's corpse. She drops her lantern and screams. It is the late 1940s, and the world is still reeling from the destruction and devastation of the Second World War. While nations are trying desperately to rebuild and citizens are mourning the fallen, the SCP Foundation has no time to grieve. Anomalous threats don't come to a stop just because the rest of the world is trying to put its collective pieces back together. For the members of the 5th Squad of the Eastern Division of the SCP Foundation, a global tragedy must take a back seat to smaller, localized, and potentially anomalous tragedy in the form of several unusual deaths in Busan, Korea. Three agents are dispatched to the area and told to investigate while posing as reporters covering the story. When they first arrive, they hear about a troubling eyewitness account that has steered local authorities in the direction of animal attacks. An elderly woman saw something eating one of her cows, a mix between a fox and a human. Naturally, the authorities have written her off, but something in her story rings true to one of the agents. He can remember tales his grandmother once told him, sadistic old bat that she was, stories of fox people with razor-sharp claws and fangs glistening with fresh blood. The other two agents have similar cultural stories to share, folk tales about women who were foxes in disguise, living amongst hapless humans. Some of the stories were romantic, about fox wives marrying human husbands, having children and families. Others were horrible, too horrible to repeat. The three agents can only hope they haven't stumbled into the latter type of story. But when has a mission from the SCP Foundation ever led to a fairy tale outcome? The three men begin to comb the area, searching for any evidence of this creature, a fox person with a taste for hunting cows, and perhaps humans as well. Before very long at all, they stumble upon a beautiful young woman sitting serenely under a waterfall. Clad in nothing more than a light robe, she tries to nervously hide her bare feet at the sight of the strange men, but she doesn't do a very good job. The three agents can plainly see, in place of the feet of a human woman, she has paws covered in reddish-brown fur, the feet of a fox. This must be a young, inexperienced creature of her kind, they realize. Otherwise, how could they have tracked her down so easily? If the men were smarter, less blinded by lust, laziness, and an eagerness for simple answers, they might have asked more questions. Questions like, why did we find her so quickly? Why isn't she hiding? How did she get close enough to kill those people when she's so bad at concealing herself? But they don't stop and think, don't stop to ask those questions, and that oversight will be what seals their fate. After realizing that the agents intend her no apparent harm, the fox woman smiles warmly at them. She invites the men to come back to her cottage with her for a hot meal and the chance to meet more of her kind. At first, Agent 3 is unsure about the offer, but the other two accept eagerly, swayed by the majority vote and reminding himself that they are three armed men against one slender, if anomalous, woman. He relents and accepts the invitation as well. They follow the lovely woman, like flies buzzing eagerly into a spider's web, without the slightest inkling of what's to come. When they reach the cottage, they find it modest but homey, rustic but warm. It has a certain undeniable charm, the same charm shared by the woman who led them there. She sits them at the dining table, the picture of delighted hospitality. She insists on serving them, and they are all too happy to let her. She pours them cups of plum wine and dishes out bowls of rice, pickled turnips, and perfectly seasoned meat. After dinner, with full bellies and sleepy, wine-fogged minds, the agents decide to stay the night in her guest beds. After all, why shouldn't they? The creature seems to mean them no harm, and she has no reason to feel threatened or try to attack them in any way. They'll see about containment options in the morning, after a good night's rest. Sometime in the night, Agent 3 wakes to find Agent 1 is gone. Strangely, he must have gotten up to use the bathroom in the night, or rather to make use of a bush outside, since there is no formal bathroom in the cottage. The thought reminds Agent 3 of his own full bladder, and he tiptoes out into the night to relieve himself. As he stumbles through the darkness, he suddenly hears muffled groaning, the wet slap of flesh against flesh. All at once, it hits him. 
Agent One must be out here, and from the sound of it, he isn't alone. Surely he wouldn't, but up ahead, he can make out the silhouettes of Agent One and the Fox Woman together. That's a Foundation ethics violation of some kind, it has to be. Agent Three opens his mouth to say something when Agent One suddenly collapses to the ground in front of the Fox Woman. As his eyes adjust to the dark, Agent Three can see that his fallen friend's shirt is stained with blood and his throat has been ripped out. In her clawed hand, the Fox Woman holds Agent One's liver, steaming with body heat in the cool night air. She lifts the organ up, examining it with a hungry glint in her eye. Then she opens her mouth, sticks out her tongue, and swallows the liver in a single gulp. The sight reminds Agent Three of a snake devouring a mouse and his stomach turns as disgust, horror, and grief overwhelm his system all at once. He watched as the fox woman lowered one extra sharp fingernail, using it like a scalpel, and began to cut at the fallen man's skin. All at once, his legs are able to move again. He sprints back toward the cottage, shaking Agent Two awake. Agent Three can't quite get his words together, his thoughts scrambled from the horror he just witnessed, but he manages to get one coherent sentence out. We need to leave. Now, before Agent 2 can ask what the hell is going on, Agent 1 walks into the room as if nothing ever happened. Much to Agent 3's shock, the man doesn't have a gaping hole where his liver should be. That's impossible. But wait, his eyes, they're glowing yellow. That's not an SCP Foundation agent. Something is terribly wrong. Agent 3 doesn't have time to explain to the other agent what's happening. He doesn't have time to think. All he has time to do is draw his weapon and fire at the imposter. As anyone might do in this maddening situation, Agent 2 draws his weapon, pointing it at 3 and ordering him to put the weapon away. 3 tries to explain to convince him that the man he just shot is not their friend, but the fox in disguise. He won't listen, promising to put Agent 3 down like a mad dog for killing their comrade. That's when the fox sees her opening. She grabs hold of Agent 2 from behind knocking the gun out of his hand, causing it to discharge. Agent 3 cries out in pain as the bullet pierces his flesh, only his upper shoulder, thankfully. Not a fatal wound, but it still hurts like absolute hell. He collapses to the ground from the pain, screaming, while the fox laughs at his misery. It's a truly demonic sound, a loud, high cackle like nothing he's ever heard before. The sound is too much, he has to get away from it, away from her put something between him and this monster. He drags himself into the living room, pulling the rice paper screen door shut. It won't protect him, but at least he doesn't have to look at her. Unfortunately, another horror awaits him there. On the dining table, laid out like a roast pig ready for carving, is another agent, a man he and the others saw at the base of the mountain a day before. But now, his eyes are wide and glassy, his skin pale and lifeless. He spots the empty bowls, and all at once, the sickening truth washes over him. Their dinner. That meat wasn't pork or beef. It was human. And they didn't eat it with rice, but with maggots, crawling over the meat, slippery and white. His stomach can't help but empty itself, and as he heaves onto the floor, he sees a few maggots still alive in the vomit. No time to think about it anymore. No time to sit with the horrors and let them paralyze him. He needs a weapon, and fast. He manages to snap off a piece of a wooden beam, breaking it into a jagged edge. He angles it just right, just in time for the fox woman to tear through the rice paper door. He jams the jagged edge of the wooden beam into her stomach and makes a run for it. He tears out of the cottage and into the forest, tripping over the rugged landscape and fighting through the agony of his gunshot wound. Suddenly, the sound of running water, a welcome oasis in the dark and the terror. He stumbles onto the riverbank attempting to wade through the water and cross. But he has too many forces working against him. The pitch black night, the fear, the pain, the confusion from the blood loss. He slips on the wet rocks, hits his head, and is swept away by the rapids. He floats down the river for at least half a mile before he grabs hold of a branch strong enough to pull himself back out of the water. As he drags himself onto dry land, heaving and gasping, he realizes something. He recognizes where he is, the van is just a few feet away. He has a sudden revelation. Fire. In the stories he heard growing up, fire was always the key to defeating an evil force. He doesn't have the keys, but that doesn't matter. He busts through the window and opens up the back. There it is, 
a Foundation-issue defoliant projector, better known as a good old-fashioned flamethrower. This should do it, if that evil woman manages to track him down again. As if summoned by his thoughts, there she is, emerging out of the tree line. She smiles at him, eyes gleaming with menace. He raises the flamethrower and prepares to rain down hell on the monster that killed his friends and fed him their flesh. Several days later, a Foundation retrieval team manages to track down Agent 3. They find him with the Foxwoman, whom they manage to capture and bring into custody. He is a shadow of himself, pale, sweaty, body fighting off a severe infection. He's quickly taken to a hospital to recuperate. Meanwhile, the Foundation is able to study the Foxwoman, who is designated SCP-953, the polymorphic humanoid. About SCP-953, a few things are certain. She is a female red fox, approximately 8 kilograms in weight, with a spine that splits around her 26th vertebra into 9 separate tails. She has polymorphic properties and is able to take on various other forms. Most commonly, she takes on the shape of a beautiful Korean woman. Whenever in a human form, however, she does still maintain at least one fox-like characteristic such as ears, paws, tail, eyes, or mannerisms. If she is able, she will attempt to conceal these elements through various methods of disguise, such as clothing, hats, and hairstyles. In addition to her polymorphic abilities, SCP-953 is observed to possess other supernatural abilities. She has the power of suggestion and telepathy. She can convince others of falsehoods, concealing her nature and the nature of things around her. While the Foundation is discovering this, Agent 3 is busy recovering from his injuries. When he is discharged from the hospital, he sits down for an interview with the Foundation Assistant Director. He lays out the Foundation's plans to terminate the Foxwoman, given her malicious nature and unknown levels of power. Agent 3 vehemently opposes this choice, begging them not to do so. He advises them to contain her, but to be cautious about how they do so. Ordinary methods, he advises, will not be effective. He pleads with the Foundation to consider the creature's nature, saying, She's spiteful. Every little slight in her eyes, she saves up. And the only way she knows how to repay an insult is death. Chaining her to the wall like an animal, when she gets out, and she will get out, she's going to kill everyone who had the slightest thing to do with it. She won't settle for anything less. He gives suggestions for what the Foundation can do to contain the creature, but above all, insists that she be kept alive. At this point, the interviewer points out that the agent has been visiting SCP-953 in her containment cell. He questions the agent's motives, suggesting he might have Stockholm Syndrome. The agent refuses to consider that possibility. In return, the interviewer has him taken to Site-51 for psychological analysis. The containment procedures are left unchanged. The interviewer includes this note with the transcription of the interview. On a side note, I am appalled by the level of superstition expressed by the agent throughout the course of this interview. I am recommending that his suggestions regarding containment be disregarded for a more scientific approach. We're not old Korean fishwives here. I'm sure we can think of something more effective than dogs and needles. Not long after the interview, SCP-953 escapes from custody, killing several Foundation personnel in the process. They managed to recapture her, but she escaped again, and again and again. After her sixth escape, the Foundation is unable to track her down. She remains unseen for years, sneaking around under the radar, as the Foundation waits for the inevitable bloodbath that will ensue when she gets bored enough. Years pass, and the date of the annual Yifcon rolls around again. This is of little interest to the Foundation. Why would they be monitoring the goings-on of a small furry convention? Well, maybe they should be, because there is no better place in the world for a foxwoman to pass unnoticed. If anything, with only her ears and tail showing through her human form, she's a bit underdressed compared to the rest of the attendees. A few convention-goers stop to admire the beautiful woman with the reddish-brown fox ears and tail, but most of them don't even give her a second glance. Unfortunately for the convention's attendees, she has far more malicious plans than supporting small businesses by purchasing some art or a body pillow. She passes out cards with her room number on them to various strangers, inviting them to an after-hours party in her room. With her friendly face and gorgeous smile, how could they say no? After all, it's a friendly event, and nothing bad ever happens at Yifcon. When a dozen anthropomorphic animal enthusiasts arrive at SCP-953's room, they find a few bottles of wine and an uneasy atmosphere. Still, 
they're excited to socialize, and thrilled to have been invited to an after-hours party. They don't notice her sliding the deadbolt into place behind them, placing her body between them and their only exit. An hour later, another hotel guest calls the police to alert them to the sounds of horrific screams coming from down the hall. But when the police arrive, they can't hear anything. The place is eerily quiet. As they approach the offending room, they hear the sounds of a respectfully tame party inside, and a beautiful woman answers the door, assuring them that everything is fine. The officers turn and leave without a second thought, and as the victims inside the room continue to scream, the cops can't hear a thing. They don't know it, but they're trapped in her thrall. The next morning, a hotel housekeeper knocks on the door of the ill-fated room. No one answers, and there isn't a Do Not Disturb sign on the door, so she lets herself in. As soon as she opens the door, she regrets it. There, so engrossed in her gleeful bloodlust that she doesn't even notice the intrusion, is SCP-953, surrounded by dozens of corpses. The housekeeper calls 911, but after stuttering out a few words on the situation, a clawed hand grabs hold of her hair and yanks her back inside. The poor housekeeper will never be seen again. Not alive, anyway. Fortunately, it was enough information to alert the Foundation to the situation at hand. Unfortunately, by the time they arrive on the scene, there are over two dozen corpses littering the hotel floor. One is stuffed into a mattress, another hanging over a shower curtain rod, one rolled up in a carpet, and another is strewn across a banquet table. Any survivors are brought into Foundation custody and given Class A amnestics to wipe their memories. The convention concludes early, under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak. During the chaos, the Foundation managed to bring SCP-953 into custody. This time, they acknowledge the need to amend the containment procedures they have been using. They can't let her escape again. Today, SCP-953 is kept in a Type 4 containment cell at Site 17. She is provided the following necessities. Fresh liver daily, clean drinking water and plenty of it, a futon and clean bedding for it, which is laundered weekly. When she is on her best behavior and has been especially non-violent, she is occasionally presented with a small luxury item, such as a book, a dessert, or a bottle of plum wine. Direct human contact with SCP-953 has been strictly prohibited due to her psychic abilities. Delivery of her food or any other items is to be carried out by an automated robotic assistant. In addition to her physical containment, psychological measures with a folkloric origin have been employed. The entrance to her containment chamber is lined with open cage dog kennels containing Korean Jindo or American Foxhound dogs. She will not approach any canines out of an apparent aversion, especially when one is barking. SCP-953 is considered extremely hostile, dangerous, and armed at all times, given the nature of her razor-sharp claws and numerous deadly abilities. I found this addendum attached to her official file concerning folklore control procedures as they pertain to SCP-953. As a reminder, staff assigned to SCP-953 are to follow all instructions for interacting with the subject, no matter how odd or arbitrary they may seem. Keep in mind that the people of Asia interacted with these beings for centuries before we came onto the scene. What we think of as fairy tales were their version of special containment procedures. Personally, I hope to never encounter SCP-953 under any circumstances, though as I say that, a disquieting thought crosses my mind. It's entirely possible I have, at some point, and simply didn't know it. After all, she is capable of shifting her shape in countless ways and is a master of trickery and deception. I may very well have crossed paths with her before. I suppose I'll never know for sure. All I know is that I still have my liver. For now. And for that, I am very, very grateful. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-4966, Tabioka, Devourer of Souls, Consumer of Secrets, Lord of Munchies.